Hi, Camrose. It's a tremendous pleasure to have this opportunity to finally talk more in depth about your work. And thanks again for being part of Relations. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, really happy to be part of that show. Um, it's a shame that I couldn't be with you in Montreal. Yes, I, it's the, it's um, you know sort of so close yet so far. It's a, <laughs> like a real um, yeah pain point, but we do what we can. Sure. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned when we first started talking through email, was that I experienced a very large work of yours at the Jamil Art Center um, back in June of 2019, and um, you know you. You work in painting, collage, drawing, installation, and photography also, which I, I wasn't aware of. And, you know, through your work, you really compel us to consider many intersecting and complex strands of discourse. Um, I mean, I can name a, like a, a few of them, like the tenets of Western modernism and how they impinge on art practices beyond, say, Western centricity, the effects and technologies of display. You know, I, it really occurred to me how you, you bring display into the notion of the fact that it's a discipline or it disciplines us too. Um, and then, of course, uh, a, a question that's near and dear to my heart, which, is, which, are, which are those of authenticity. Um, but before we get into all that, I was wondering, if we could talk about your early experiences, um, they definitely include the diasporic, but to have a glimpse into perhaps the prompts that inspired you to pursue life as an artist. Mm. Well, yeah, uh, you've just said a lot and um, I can respond to every aspect of uh, uh, every bit of what you've just said. Um, but, you know, going all the way back to what kind of prompted me to be an artist is, uh, is um, I guess it's really easy and also very difficult to answer. It's easy to answer in a very general sense uh, and, and difficult to kind of uh, answer the question of how I became a visual artist. Um, and uh, I think really it has to do for me with um, uh, a creative output of some sort. Um, as, uh, as many, uh, many young people, young immigrants who came as children to uh, another country, let's say to the United States, like myself, um, I did very well with uh, English, actually, you know, so when you are an ESL student, you tend to work twice as hard at that. And, um, and so I was writing quite a bit. And, um, and I think that writing was my first creative outlet and music as well. I was playing music for a good uh, part of uh, my younger years. Um, and so visual art really came to me um, almost as a convenience. Um, and um, it was something that uh, uh, sort of, it sounds a bit like a cop out, but it sort of found me as much as I found it. Um, mm -hmm. I knew that I was going to do something creative, that I had something uh, to contribute, something to get out, something to express. Uh, I just didn't know how that would manifest. And in fact, having a career as a visual artist was quite a surprise for me. What led you to, uh, I know it's a, it's a, it's a diff, definitely a difficult question that I asked, just sort of throwing that, th throwing that out because I, I can imagine um, how it, brings back all these kind of very various flashbacks and sort of which ones are key, which ones are maybe less significant to a pivotal moment. But um, I wanted to, I think, I feel like I want to pick apart a little bit more. It's like the, the idea of, you know, art finding you and, and um, I don't know, I, maybe it's about, a, is it a Proustian moment, you know, is there that, you know, that kind of uh, in terms of become uh, of moving in towards visual visual art, um, was it was was making marks, you know, drawing, and were these things that were extensions, perhaps, of the of the writing of the writing um, engagement earlier on? Um, I wouldn't say 
so uh, in that there was no direct relationship between my writing and visual arts, although some of the things that I tried to express in writing, I later sorted out through visual art. Um, really, I think it probably had more to do with formal education than anything else. Um, Interesting. <laughs> that art was the easiest thing to study. Um, and then I can also maybe think about the, the fields or the things that I was um, uh, intuitively most comfortable with as at the same time what I was intuitively most capable of, right? So uh, in, in a sense, I'm a terrible reader. I, I love to read and I consider myself um, uh, intellectually engaged, but I'm a terrible reader in that um, I, I find I have certain kind of reading blocks. Uh, it's kind of maybe uh, a, a weird thing to discuss uh, specifically, but for example, I see shapes in the spaces between writing. Okay. So like if I'm reading a book and there are spaces like evenly lined up, I'll start seeing lines and shapes and it'll distract me from the reading. So that's what I mean when I say I'm a terrible reader. It takes me a very long time to read a book. And so for that reason, I thought I could never be a writer because you can't be a writer without really reading a lot. And uh, it's, it's such a, uh, I won't say it's a chore for me to read, but it's quite difficult for me to read uh, as much as some of my colleagues do, let's say. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, again, sound like an anti-intellectual here. I do read I you know, I have a stack of books in front of me right now. It's just, um, uh, that was one thing that tipped me off that maybe like I don't have the patience or the, um, the intuitive abilities to really take on that field. Um, it wasn't such a conscious decision though. I mean, I think I'm, I'm making it sound too much like I planned it. Um, I, I really do think it's, it's coincidental. It was a formal education. I found that uh, I was very comfortable with the painting medium and I became more and more invested in it. Uh, I found a parallel to uh, music. I used to play drums. Um, I found a parallel to uh, improvisation and, and structures and, and um, you know, I work with patterns. One can compare those to uh, patterns in music. Um, so maybe there was a parallel there, but uh, in the end, it really had to do with formal education, I think. It's really fascinating that you're talking about seeing the negative space as, you know, these interesting shapes and geometries, because that's like a, that's a very formal mind, you know, and, and you do talk about that in terms of your process. And so we'll get to that. I'm seeing all kinds of vectors that are, uh, and lines that are intersecting and meeting. Um, I'm curious to know about whether you remember your first visit to an encyclopedic museum. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't, I don't remember my first visit to an encyclopedic museum and where it was. I do remember my first visit to the Met. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if that was my first visit to an encyclopedic museum. Um, but uh, a very close friend of mine from school uh, had, while we were still in high school, had moved to New Jersey from Ohio. And I'd gone to visit him and we, uh, it was the late nineties. We took the bus from New Jersey into New York city and um, caused all kinds of trouble. <laughs> um, but in the meantime, but you know, those, uh, before we caused trouble, we'd go to museums and um, I would, uh, we went to the Met for, uh, I think about six to eight hours or something. We spent a lot of time there. And, um, and that really was, uh, a, an eye-opening experience for me. Um, and that museum continues to be one of my favorite places in New York City and one of my favorite museums in the world. Did that experience have a kind of, did it generate that feeling of what you call cultural nostalgia, sort of in an immediate way? Um, not for me personally, no. There was some identification, you know, oh, okay, that, that's from Iran. And, and there was this, um, in the Met Museums, uh, no longer referred to as the Islamic Art Galleries, um, they have a mihrab from a mosque in Esfahan. And it's just like a, a piece of architecture. Mihrab is the niche that you pray toward um, in a mosque. And it's just a piece of architecture from Esfahan, which is, uh, I was born in Shiraz, but my entire family is from Esfahan. And there is this really kind of strange experience of encountering something uh, so uh, 
it's like this truncated piece of architecture mm-hmm. uh, and you're just seeing it's it's complete in its mihrabness but it's uh but it's so kind of fragmented and so strange to see it against um i believe now it's a gray backdrop or a beige backdrop mm-hmm. um, but it is a piece of architecture and so i think for me seeing these pieces of architecture uh, was is a little bit eerie in the museum. I, I don't know if at the time I had an immediate reaction to that, but I do remember seeing um, uh, pieces from where I came in the museum. Yeah, it, it would be eerie because these mosques are alive. You know, they're <laughs> they're spaces of gathering. They're um, you know they're monuments and and that are you know not sort of um, uh, extracted or abstracted from their context. There's so much part of the context. So um, I, I recall a, a, an indigenous artist when saying that, you know, our, our sacred objects do not belong in museums because museums are places that present um, kind of artifacts of a, of a, of a dead culture, <laughs> mm-hmm. which would, and, um, and so in that respect, I, I was, you know, making a link with, with uh, having heard that and thinking about, you know, your, your uh, assessment of this eeriness of this, you know, this fragment of something that's very much alive, uh, you know, in, in a museum setting like that. Yeah, that's an, I mean, it's an interesting perspective and it's tricky. There are, you know, I, I, I never think there are two groups of people, but, you know, for, for, to, uh, for the sake of argument, there, there are two kinds of people that maybe uh, two different perspectives on the museum, right? One is right. Uh, maybe two perspectives, two post-colonial perspectives on the museum. One is that it completely needs to be undone, that the museum as we know it is uh, a colonial location and it, it doesn't, everything that it does is problematic, right? And that it should be torn down and we don't need museums, period. And then there are other, another perspective would be that uh, museums uh, are not spaces where, uh, that represent objects of mm-hmm. cultures that are necessarily dead, right. but, that, um, but that there has been a problematic formation of these museums as institutions and that, that uh, the problematic side can be unraveled. Um, and uh, and then the other argument is that the problematic side cannot be unraveled because it's inherent in what the museum means and what it stands for. I don't know where I stand. You know, I think I'm constantly trying to negotiate that. I think that's a very healthy tension to uh, be entertaining regularly when it comes to museums. You know, there, there's always ideas around uh, decolonizing museums um, and very much recognizing um, of the value that they can have for community and for society and for like getting people out of the bubbles that, you know, we are entering to in more and more dangerous ways. Mm-hmm. But I hear you and I, and I see all those arguments and, um, you know, sort of rather than, I don't know, rather than feeling you have to take a position, it's rather like, well, how can all these positions kind of work together, um, you know, so that we can, we can be critical and then we can also see how we can, um, uh, work with what we've got and exactly. be aware of what we what we've got. Yeah, I, mean, I tend to think I tend to think that it's a little bit. I, I feel it's a little bit cynical to work within the field in order to dismantle the field. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I I understand kind of re, restructuring the field, uh, but to kind of work uh, as a person in a museum or in, as an artist. Uh, to try to dismantle the entire thing is, it just feels cynical to me, you know, because right. I don't think that, I do find a lot of joy, like talking about that early experience in the museum. I do find a lot of satisfaction and a lot of inspiration and joy in the museum. So what does it mean for me to find that? And uh, how can I come to terms with that is something that I'm interested in. Mm-hmm. It comes out in your work, most definitely. And now that I we've been having this conversation. I'm thinking about my first time in an encyclopedic museum. It was definitely the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, and I was probably five years old, I guess. And I loved it. 
I, it, I think the, it was when this big sort of Tutankhamun show was, was traveling around, sort of been mm -hmm. in the mid seventies. And uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a very formatively um, impacting experience to kind of be in those, those majestic spaces and then, you know, to, to come across civilizations um, and it was very engaging of the imagination. So sort of, I think something that a lot of kids, you know, that was sort of their first experience with uh, stuff outside of, you know, their, their own four walls, their family, their school, you know, so I, I get it. Um, I would like to unpack the term cultural nostalgia mm -hmm. a little bit. If you could walk, walk me through your... Um, yeah, I think that it's, uh, I, like, as I said, I'm a frequent visitor to the Met. And when I go there, I often see um, people sort of finding themselves in the museum. So there's, um, so when I go to the uh, Islamic art galleries, the formerly known as the Islamic art galleries at the Met, um, you see Muslims there, you know, visibly Muslims, you know, hijab, beard, like whatever, you see like practicing Muslims there, you see uh, maybe secular Muslims there, but you definitely see people there finding themselves. Mm. Um, uh, same with, um, you know, you go to the, on the same floor on the opposite end of the museum and, um, and you find Chinese arts and you find Chinese people there finding themselves. And um, in a way it's uh, this kind of longing for your glorious past, this kind of way of, uh, and especially when you are living abroad. And um, I, I think that a lot of Iranians, um, you know, whether they left, it's, it's, it's not about uh, the revolution. You know, the revolution caused a lot of people to leave, but a lot of people left before and after. Um, it's about the current state. I feel that a lot of Iranians who left Iran left because it was hard to live there for some reason. A lot of people who left uh, any kind of country in the East and came to the so-called West um, left for uh, a better quality of life. Mm -hmm. And so to look back onto your ancient past as when things were great for you uh, was, and I realize, I, I recognize what that sounds like in the year 2020, um, that that's for me like a form of cultural nostalgia, to look at cultural objects, to look at um, the uh, uh, ancient Persian art in the Met or in the, um, uh, uh, the British Museum or wherever, and to kind of um, talk about what a great culture we were. We had 7,000 years of history and, uh, and, and even thinking about um, the state of the Islamic world right now, whatever that means, I also mm -hmm. recognize the problem of that term, um, but uh, the state of what Islam represents to uh, a lot of people globally um, and particularly in the West and a time when Islamic science and Islamic art was um, excelling in the, um, around the world. And, um, and to look at those you know, objects from that cultural past, it's like a form of cultural nostalgia to think that um, it, it, it's maybe avoiding what are we doing today and looking at, look at all the great things we did hundreds if not thousands of years ago. It's so it's very diasporic consciousness uh, to me to sort of um, connect through uh, objects to one's you know um, heritage and glorious past of, of the civilization of what uh, of which one uh, shares origins. Mm -hmm. um, when I went to I think it was Victoria and Albert Museum and saw a Chinese dragon robe for the first time in you know. Uh, an actual one and not seeing it as a reproduction or an image in a book, I started to cry. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's not, and I even have a, a, a very distant relationship with my Chinese heritage, mm -hmm. um, but the proximity to, to the, the object, which kind of validated, but more so it proved, you know, it proved that this was, uh, um, it, it proved the, virtuosity of this 
civilization to create such a garment. Um, right. And uh, I, 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 while I don't idealize my heritage or China as this homeland that I long to return to because I, you know, I wasn't born there. I don't speak Chinese. And as I, you know, it's a very estranged um, relationship. That type of thing can happen that, that, you know, very visceral uh, um, engagement with the material mm -hmm. uh, is something I would say from a personal from personal experience is really powerful. Right, right. Yeah. There's, uh, there's also, I mean, aside from the personal and the immediate, there's the, uh, or the personal and the diasporic. Um, I also, it occurred to me that uh, a form of cultural nostalgia exists in uh, Mussolini's Rome, you know, this, this kind of looking back to uh, uh, Roman arch classical architecture and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, the, mm -hmm. the kind of fascist architecture in Rome uh, is like a form of cultural nostalgia. So it's not always mm -hmm. this, you know, I think it's a, yeah, it's, it's a complicated thing. It, it can come with, um, it has a dark side to it. Maybe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I think I've, or I've heard you describe it as a love-hate relationship yeah, in a perhaps. way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pivot then to the paintings that engage with, the, with floral motifs mm -hmm. uh, derived from um, traditional Persian art forms. Uh, how and how you bring these motifs into contact and dialogue with geometric or, you know, modern shapes or grids. I guess the hallmarks of modernism, as if modernism has a monopoly on these shapes, but you know, can you tell me about the evolution of that exploration? Yeah, um, I'm reminded of uh, a friend of mine at, um, at an opening recently, uh, not so recently, we haven't had openings for a while, but um, maybe a year or so ago, uh, asked me how I, uh, asked me about my relationship to the grid. And I was talking about the grid as really the uh, the beginning of pattern. Um, it is the infrastructure of pattern, but also perhaps can be considered the first or most primitive pattern is the grid. And um, and she was surprised that I didn't mention Rosalind Cross. And mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, well, that's interesting because uh, uh, and she was surprised, but also kind of uh, enjoyed that fact. I think yeah. that. Um, because that's such a predictable kind of conversa art historical conversation, right? To talk about the modernist grid. Um, and uh, maybe part of what I intend to uh, highlight is that, um, uh, is that not everything is rooted in modernism. <laughs> and modernism is also, you know, um, has a lot of resources uh, and is not, um, it's not something that uh, sprouted up in Europe and uh, autonomously by these European geniuses, right? right. Uh, and so, <clears throat> in a way, um, I'm also coming from the perspective of a painter who was trained um, with people who uh, were brought up with the Hans Hoffmann method of painting, a very kind of American modernist approach to painting. Um, uh, this kind of improvisational finding uh, attention and balance within the canvas and, and working all the parts of the canvas at once. And, um, and you know, this, the way that I was trained as an artist uh, and the images that I sort of was um, influenced by as I kind of matured as an artist, um, to me, I was told maybe that they, they were contradictory, but maybe I don't see that so much. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I'm speaking a little bit cryptically now, but uh, uh, for example, um, I saw very early on in my education, I started seeing a parallel between Persian carpets and painting and, and modernist painting. Um, Persian carpets were these kind of formal investigations on a flat rectangular surface, um, the same way that paintings were the process was very different. Um, and the, it was the process and the notion of authorship that was very different, right? And so I kind of um, became more and more interested in um, 
how I could negotiate that relationship through painting. Um, and at the same time, I was seeing a lot of carpet stores when I was in graduate school in New York, in the New York City carpet stores where they're kind of the most commodified, um, the most kind of luxury good. Uh, and, and I do distinguish, you know, sort of like art carpets from carpets that are really de actually decorative. Um, that are made uh, as a kind of um, frivolous or uh, superfluous formal kind of things to put in the house to uh, and, and don't really have the depth that the carpets come from. But the carpets and many of the sort of arts that are called minor arts um, in these encyclopedic museums or have been in the past, sometimes um, maybe some people are coming to terms with uh, renegotiating that uh, hierarchy. Mm -hmm. hopefully, um, that these carpets come out of uh, ideas, they come out of a discourse, they come out of uh, having um, a spiritual meaning. Uh, uh, so they're not purely decorative. Um, and so the ornamental is not necessarily decorative. And um, um, I've, I've kind of used this example before to say that a Frank Stella has as much potential to be decorative as a Persian carpet. And a Persian carpet has, is just as capable of having content as a Frank Stella painting. Um, I don't think Frank Stella would argue with that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I don't know if I've answered your question so directly, but um, uh, that's where the Persian, the floral patterns from Persian carpets came from the uh, carpets that I was photographing in New York City carpet stores. Um, and then kind of working them over through that very kind of um, abexy methodology. Oh, you totally are, are you know, sort of uh, unpacking it very well, you know, for us. Um, the uh, because what I what I really um, find is that, that you create this dialogue, or like you, it, it's it's not so much a mashup. I hope I don't offend you by <laughs> using a term no, no. terminology like that. It's, uh, but you do um, kind of bring us to consider um, the binary and say like, binary? What binary? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you know, and um, to also think about, you know, as Rahel um, Ama wrote in, your, in the essay that accompanies um, your your work in our publication that the floral motif is can be considered dias diasporic you know so mm -hmm. it's removed from its original context you know it, it it it's in you to you know explore those motifs mm -hmm. and then to apply also your training mm -hmm. um and your observation and critical thinking as well you know to to do something that becomes a game completely unique Mm -hmm. uh, a unique vision and a unique aesthetic language um, through these works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's quite a lot going on. It's uh, really fascinating. Um, I'm just take, checking out my notes on that on this particular piece, but I think yeah, I think that gives us a bit of a you know a good foray into what is a pretty significant. Uh, a um, series of, of exploration it would seem in, in sort of in your corpus. Are you still sort of pushing that further in, in, current, in your current practice? Um, so for the last couple of years I've been making um, paintings that I've uh, referred to as the arabesque paintings. Um, the, the, I'm, I don't remember which came first, the painting or the title. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the name, the, the word arabesque is fascinating to me because I, I never knew exactly what it meant. And um, although I knew what it felt like it meant, um, so, uh, but I, I'm finding, I, I find that it's really kind of a generic or general term for um, something that is an exotic pattern or an Eastern pattern. And, um, it was, you know, a term that was used by uh, the French to refer to uh, North African art. Um, uh, it was, um, 
I imagine there's something of a curvature involved in that form. I, I don't know if it refers to the mosque architecture. Um, it, it's still kind of a little bit baffling to me mm -hmm. what, it, what it actually means. Um, and so I started making uh, paintings that um, were not based on a pattern that I found anywhere. Uh, they were building the pattern from within. So starting with the grid, um, and uh, rather than connecting the lines in the grid uh, through geometry and through straight edges, uh, I was using uh, a, a sort of collaboration between the grid and the natural gestures of my body. So uh, the way that my arm would move to make uh, a curvature um, with an oil crayon on the canvas um, and using the grid as a map to go from point A to point B uh, as, as, as a guidance. And so this kind of formal investigation of uh, line really became uh, a series of paintings that I call the arabesque paintings. Um, and I do think, I think it's funny because I, Iranians are not Arabs and they're often thought to be Arabs uh, by people who are n neither Iranian nor Arab. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so uh, I think it's kind of funny because uh, it's, uh, you know, something that I grew up with. Um, so uh, this idea of be becoming um, the, sort of, the sort of generalized other is uh, something that I feel like is also a very uh, diasporic experience. Um, and, uh, and I think that that reflects in visual forms as well. Um, that visual forms are thought to be generally other. Um, and so this idea of forms being other is something that's really interesting to me. Like how, uh, where is the line where something goes from being like a Western form into like becoming an exotic or Eastern form? Um, and uh, I've always, because, you know, as an artist, you don't get, uh, you do have some opportunities to speak for yourself and write about your work, but oftentimes somebody else is saying something about your work and oftentimes the things that come up with my work have to do with me being Iranian. And, um, and so it really makes you question how much have I actually put in there that, uh, that makes the work quote unquote appear to be Iranian and how much is it because I have an Iranian name and my place of birth is Shiraz. So, uh, so, you know, I think in a way I started reflecting on that as well um, and, and through the process of painting. Mm. When I think of arabesque, I think of the, the dance move in ballet. And yeah. you know, so when you speak of the gesture, you know, it, it does conjure up, um, you know, this kind of move, you know, this mm -hmm. kind of dance move. And, and then I was sort of picking up on what you were saying about like, exoticizing mm -hmm. and sometimes in my own art practice I've been very concerned with self exoticizing and, mm -hmm. and whether that um, uh, it, if I'm doing that you know sort of like to to be critical of, of uh, how I'm uh, of self representation but, and then the kind of burden of representation for uh, you know other Asian people mm -hmm. in in you know and and how they're seen how they're perceived in um you know a north american context mm -hmm. western context yeah. so you know it's like who's doing the exoticizing it can actually go both ways but you know you have to consider uh the reality of uneven um power relations as well mm -hmm. in terms of who's going to have more sway in terms of that perception you know sort of carrying weight you know what i mean Mm -hmm. I, perhaps that's one of the reasons that uh, I've also been interested in form, be, having a more formalist approach and, and okay. being interested in abstraction is because maybe there's a little bit more space or it's a little bit uh, more loose. It's uh, the signifiers are not so concrete. Yeah, the, the uh, concealing and revealing has uh, some possibilities in abstraction that, that um, yeah, maybe a little too uh sharp and pointed in in other other ways or other approaches mm -hmm. so let's talk process um mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I feel like there's a lot of research involved in your work um from and and, and yet you well not and yet but and you consider your your process um as very formal and intuitive 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, it, again, it's one of those things where I think a lot of people who have uh, written about my work have referred to me as a process-based, or I'm sorry, uh, a research-based artist. Um, I think that that's maybe, um, I don't know how I feel about that. I mean, I, I do some research, but I'm, you know, when you think about, my brother is a scientist, he does re real research, you know, and I know artists who are uh, deeply invested in, in research as well. Um, I would say that, you know, my approach to research is, uh, is not an academic one. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I do a lot of visual research um, and I, uh, uh, I'm not at the library, you know, um, uh, with like 10 books in front of me about ancient Iranian art. Um, I'm in the studio with 10 books on ancient Iranian art, but I'm cutting up and uh, making collages with, you know. So there is some research I, I do, uh, but I think the objective of the work um, is maybe not to um, represent some kind of research, but to uh, explore things visually. Yeah, that, that makes a that makes a lot of sense. I think the, you know, the idea of research creation, and this is the distinction between, I guess, research based practice, and, you know, um, using and becoming informed, you know, through a research process, which is, you know, look, looking at books, or, you know, talk to people or, you know, uh, whatever secondary research materials you may be um, going to the the distinguishing factor seems to be like original questions that you then go out to the field kind of test these questions come back with some data and then you know and, and then also yeah and then incorporate them into what could become a work at a, at a later point mm -hmm. and it doesn't even have to be about a work or finishing finishing a piece either mm -hmm. uh, there's also some element of experimentation but i i would i would probably put forth that you know artists are always experimenting and pushing and so that doesn't necessarily make it a distinguishing feature for research-based practice mm -hmm. maybe it is just that primary research um element being kind of the most important as a kind of research, you know, an artist who, you know, really engages with research. Do you know what I right, mean? <laughs> right. Yeah, well, there are artists who, you know, uh, make biographical work. They study a certain f historical figure and get into that uh, yeah. for, you know, study research historical figure for years and make work referring to that, you know. Um, but then there is, you can call research, um, material research, learning how to use new materials, or, uh, you know, I, um, I often tour Italy to see architecture as part of my research, you know, so going to see all, I've seen most of the Carlo Scarpa buildings in Italy, and um, I mean, that's impactful, you know, that's a big yes. part of, uh, that, that has a huge impact on what I do, um, and it is a form of research, but uh, yeah, it's not um, uh, that kind of maybe a narrative research that one might assume. Yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of Scarpa, let's talk about your backdrop works. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if we could, uh, if we could hone in on the one that we have here in Montreal, a uh, blue backdrop for minor arts. Uh, right. And in these works, you bring, uh, again, a lot of ideas together uh, into a very formally engaging proposal and it's such a great challenge to unpack it. Um, and then it becomes really satisfying when you start to, you know, pull out all the different colored handkerchiefs, you know, out of mm -hmm. that top hat. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would love to hear you. I mean, I could go on, but <laughs> <laughs> that's why you're here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, I, that's a really nice way to, I, I'm glad you respond to the work that way because I, I it's nice to think that, um, a work that appears to be very simple can kind of unravel over time, which is what I would like for it to do. Um, well, this this work in, in general, I think that the um, the sculptural works for me create an interdependence between an object on display, the mechanism of display, and the painting uh, or the backdrop for that object. Uh, the painting 
is made as a, a geometric abstraction, um, but I want to push it toward, I want to walk the line between design and painting. I want to, and the, something that can be uh, really just, just a backdrop, um, but push it just enough toward um, painting that it still has the vibe of a painting. It still has the presence, the affect of a painting. So, um, so for me, that's the, the painting element. Um, at the same time, the painting is responding to the objects on display. The pedestal is responding to the painting as well as the object it displays. Um, everything is made kind of at the same time. I talked earlier about that Hans Hoffman approach to painting. Really, it's embedded in, in the sculptural works as well. Um, and when I work with space, if I do uh, exhibition design, it also has to do with, um, the, I think the process for me is very uh, painterly in a sense. Um, so uh, thinking about the, the object that's on display, it's, there's no didactic text. There's nothing that kind of informs the viewer what this object is, where it was made, when it was made, who made it. Um, and so uh, that's important to me because I would like to challenge the way that we assign value to these objects. Um, uh, I also uh, wanted to um, highlight the so-called decorative object, the assumed de decorative object, which is the vase on display, um, and uh, put the painting in the in the back as a backdrop to kind of turn the tables on um, this kind of art historical hierarchy. Um, and, uh, and the mechanism of display for me is quite architectural and at the same time sculptural and painterly at the same mm -hmm. time. So um, I hope that that feel that I, it feels that they feel interdependent in the sense that they feel as one experience. And I hope that that one singular experience is something that one can um, relate to uh, in the world and in, in the museum uh, and, and, and to kind of remember that that is, um, that when we see the objects in the museum, they are within the architectural uh, context, that, that the architecture becomes part of the, it's like that mihrab from Isfahan that I was talking about, you know, that it's not this isolated thing. It's this thing within this building and this building means something and the object or the fragment of architecture means something else. And then together they mean something else. And um, so uh, maybe that's a little bit more specific. I'm getting a little bit more specific into what I think about when I make them. Uh, and I'm not expecting the viewer to necessarily, you know, uh, go back to the museum and, um, and rethink the way that uh, they saw that mihrab, but hopefully after this conversation, they will. Oh, yeah. Uh, the, the question of authenticity, too, is really interesting to me in that you um, sometimes make the object that is part of the work, and sometimes there are objects that you found um, in, a cont in, in sort of everyday life. I'm imagining you at a, like a garage sale or something and going, this is perfect for, you know, for one of my pieces. And, and, I, and I wanted to know about, if you would talk a little bit about why you chose that uh, strategy. Yeah, so uh, the objects range from objects that I've made myself, objects that I've designed and had fabricated, uh, objects that I've acquired from uh, antique and antiquities dealers. Um, objects that I've acquired uh, from museum gift shops even. Right. Um, so there's just a wide range of, uh, of, of ceramics and sometimes bronze and glass. Um, and, and I'm interested in, you know, doing more. I've done some stone carving as well. Um, sometimes it's more obvious what the object is and, and uh, whether I've made it or not. Um, it's not so important to me that it's like this big secret because I don't, it's, it's not my intention to trick the viewer. Um, it's just my intention to take the focus off of that impulse to say, oh, that's a thousand years old and therefore it means this, right? I had an experience uh, 
as I was first starting to think about making this work, I hadn't even made any sculptural works yet, when I was in um, an antique shop in a ceramics shop, I shouldn't even call it an antique shop, more of a ceramics gallery in Hong Kong. And I saw what appeared to be like a gorgeous ancient vase. And, and I spoke with them a little bit, found out that it's 3000 years old. And um, I asked the price and I remember thinking that the price was too high for me to acquire, but way too low for something that would have been 3000 years old. Um, so I, I realized that it was obviously fake, uh, but they, the, they had faked it so well that when I looked at it, I had that feeling that one gets that awe of, wow, this, this is such a special object. And that's when I asked myself, well, what makes this object less special once you find out that it's fake? Or do you, would, if you, is it okay to just kind of stick your head in the sand and just say, I don't know. <laughs> it is what it is. It's a beautiful object and it makes me feel a certain way and, you know, to trust that. Um, so in a way that's maybe when I first started thinking about uh, the way that we assign value to objects. Um, there are a lot of other layers there as well. Well, I think it's a, uh, a good strategy that, um, you know, it all becomes just a riddle, you know, for us to start to start working through. Um, and, you know, that, that lack of, of didactics is sort of the thing that I think other encyclopedic museums, maybe not, but art museums could do with a little more of, you know, like, like that less would be more because then it does um, compel us as visitors to, to actually think about what's going on here sure. as opposed to sort of just, you know, getting the expected information and also challenging our own expectations of what it is we're actually seeing or what we think we're seeing. Yeah. And there's some, you know, I, I think we are attracted to, and I am, uh, to layers and to seeing the passage of time on the surface. That's really, paint, that's what a lot of painting is. And I, uh, that series of paintings where I was working with Persian carpet patterns and wiping them away and rebuilding them, they were called palimpsest paintings. And um, for those who are not familiar with the term, it's a Greek term that refers to the tablet that um, was written upon and then scraped away and then written upon again and scraped away. And each time it was uh, scraped away, you would see evidence of previous layers. And so that palimpsest would build over time, which is, uh, you know, in many of my paintings, you can see um, many different layers and evidence of the previous layers. Uh, and I thought about somebody who is uh, faux aging a ceramic object is going through a similar process of layering and sanding down and probably like rubbing down with dirt or something, even, you know, painting uh, uh, what appears to be age. Um, and that's, I mean, that's kind of fantastic. I've, I've acquired objects that I know are fake and, um, just because I think they did such a wonderful job making it uh, look aged. And um, uh, yeah, so I, I, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, mm -hmm. idea for me, but there is definitely a parallel to, in painting. There, there's also a parallel you make to music um, mm -hmm. with these works. And now that I know that you're, you know, a drummer, <laughs> it all makes sense. You know, mm. the, do you think you could reformulate the analogy of these works to, you know, to music? Um, which works, the paintings or? The, I think the backdrop works, sort oh. of music being, having remember. an analogy to that. Yeah, well, I don't remember uh, if, I don't remember saying that about those works, but um, okay. it's possible that I did because I'm, I'm, I'm really forgetful about, you know, what I've said about, the work, but at, at the moment it doesn't. Yeah, it could be. Uh, it could be me too. That that you know, when I'm making, um, compiling my notes and reading mm -hmm. through interviews and things, and I I kind of you know extract them, and then I can't quite remember what the reference was. But um, 
I'll read it to you and, and if it may not be the backdrop works, so maybe you can tell me which set of works it's, you're referring to. It's something like, quote, sometimes you're actively listening. The music is on, you're totally present, following the lyrics, there's no distraction, there's nothing else. But other times, perhaps most of the time, you might be in a car or a cafe and a song is on and you're talking with someone and that song somehow affects your mood and affects your conversation, but in a way that you can't quite say. Perhaps it happens at the subconscious level. The music is a backdrop. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, that's totally, uh, I remember that. And, um, and that is, um, I was talking with a musician actually about that. Um, that is uh, less about the process of making music and more about, you know, the process of hearing music and, and, um, and what it feels like to, um, to have music on that, that this is my, maybe my thinking about the decorative and how Okay. The decorative is not 100% passive. It's less activated, but it does something else. So that um, it brings, you know, you change the mood with the music. Like if Nina Simone is on, and let's say it's a very loaded song, like it's a very, uh, let's say it's um, uh, four women or something, and you're it's it's on in the background and you know what the song's about, but you're not really listening. You don't even maybe identify that it's that particular song. And you definitely don't hear the lyrics because it could be even too low. But the mood of that song is in the room and it stays with you and uh, it affects everything in that room. Um, and so uh, I'd like to think that art can function in a similar way, that uh, art and architecture, I often think of artworks as being a form of ornaments within the architecture um, and you have to activate them. They're in the same space, they take up space and they kind of bring a mood to the room, but um, you're not going to get another meaning, a, a deeper meaning of that work. You're not going to peel back the layers until you start looking at it as an active viewer. Um, and you're not always looking at art as an active viewer and that's totally fine. Um, I think that we, we get to be a little bit uptight about um, whether our, our, our artists get a little bit uptight about whether the work is um, seen as decorative or whether it's being activated all the time. And um, the, the, the wonderful thing about public institutions is that more people get to experience that yeah. art and they're going there with the purpose of activating or active viewing. Um, so, uh, and, and we want more of that, of course. Uh, Mm -hmm. And you, you, you point to another great tension, you know, the decorative and the active and, and sort of activation of art and um, the idea of living with art. So if you have the opportunity and privilege to actually live with art, um, there is going to be some reflection, I would imagine, um, between living with it in a decorative sense, you know, it, it's in your you know, in your field of vision all the time and interacting with all the other noise that's, you know, in the room. And so naturally, you know, it, one is concerned with how will, how will that work, you know, be and live and how will I live with it, you know, within the context of all this other stuff. But then, you know, and to kind of feel bad about that, you know, to be bad, mm -hmm. to feel bad about like thinking about that because because mm -hmm. you want to be always thinking about the content and not does it match my sofa, right? Like this mm -hmm. kind of classic uh, uh, scene, you know, in, in Hannah and her sisters, you know, that Woody Allen film. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's so true. And I, I just feel that it's, uh, it's unrealistic to have those expectations of art, to always be, to, it's unrealistic to expect that art will always be active that way. Um, that vis visual art is just not cut out for that. I mean, it's just, I, I feel that, um, and I'm completely fine with, um, you know, I, I tend to take the other direction maybe. It's, it's like, um, if somebody says, does it match my sofa? I would say, well, 
should we like work on getting you a new sofa or should, should we do a commission? What should we do to make that space interesting? You know, um, I mean, there's, uh, because as long as we make art the way that we do and it's, it's functions in, um, in a way that is commercial, um, you're always going to have that issue. And, um, and there are a lot of artists who don't work commercially and that's great. And there are other ways to make art and, um, it's never one way or the other. Um, you know, like I said, my work gets shown in an institution and it's activated in a certain way and it goes in a collection and it's activated in a certain other way. And um, in fact, the one that you have is from a collection and um, it's being activated in a different way now than it would in that private collection. And the collection itself has a foundation that can then activate it in a different way. So that, you know, we hope for these kinds of, uh, uh, that's, really and the best that we can do, you know? Um, but, um, but the idea that somehow any kind of art can resist becoming decorative, I think is, um, is unrealistic. It's super interesting. And I wanna talk more about that. However, I do wanna to get to this other question before, you know, I exhaust uh, my, you know, our, our, your time. And mm. it's about, um, formalism and abstraction um and how they're employed by artists of color it was one of the first things that you um raised you know uh in our uh in our exchanges by email mm -hmm. um it's like who gets to use formalism <laughs> and right. abstraction and who doesn't and um how have we come to learn how to define painting and who owns history, right? That was actually your question. Who owns paintings history? Right. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I put it to you then, who is, who is permitted to use abstraction and what are the conditions attached to doing so? Yeah. Um, it's such a difficult question that is not easy to answer in a kind of Q&A yeah. manner. It's, 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 more of a, it's more of a question that we can explore together maybe. Um, from, a, from a personal uh, perspective, I was educated in the US by, as I said, mostly people who were either abstract expressionists or figurative painters. Um, they, uh, an abstract expressionist who studied with abstract expressionists, I'm not right. that old. <laughs> but uh, there was always the question of, you know, accessing that, what does it mean to access that history? You know, what, what does it mean um, for, you can think of like what, um, trying to think of an example, like let's say Iranian rock and roll bands, like trying to play American music or something in, in, this, in the 60s and, and 70s, you know, what, what, what that sounded like and how uh, oftentimes it, you know, sometimes it was really unique and original and interesting. And oftentimes it was this weird emulation or, or even Italian, there's this phenomenon in Italian pop music where um, they would take a song that was like a very well-known American rock and roll song and just put like Italian lyrics and make it a completely different right. song with the exact same melody. And that exists in all around the world. It's just like something. And so in a way, I, 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 off, I asked myself as a student, like, what does it mean for me to engage these forms that I'm being taught by these people? And there was nobody who uh, really, uh, that looked like me, that engaged with those forms, except for Manu Yektai, who just um, passed away, uh, I believe this year, who was um, uh, uh, an Iranian um, New York school painter. Um, but even, you know, when you look back at that time, even like de Kooning had to change his name and Gorky is not really Gorky's name. And there's this right. kind of assimilation that takes place even with Europeans. Uh, Gorky was Armenian, I believe. Um, and, and so um, in a way, I feel that uh, a lot of us who are people of color working in abstraction are kind of 
coming to terms with what it means to us in the in the present day. I mean, I can speak only for myself, but there was a time where I thought formalism was kind of a form of like white privilege or something that they, it was something that I couldn't access because I didn't have the privilege to access. Um, that it also, I myself as a person in society, I'm so politicized that I couldn't um, work in such an apolitical way. Um, it took me a while to realize that how political form can be and um, and that my engagement with formalism can be political itself in some ways. Um, so, and, and I've seen many artists uh, of color who engage abstraction and, um, and it, and it becomes something else in their hands. It's at once um, a process, it's at once uh, the work that they're making, but it's also a subject in a way. Um, it also, uh, abstraction becomes, that, that history becomes subject matter for us, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Our participation in that uh, discourse has meaning. I think it's really important that artists of color do engage with abstraction um, as a, as a political gesture, as an as an as a knowledgeable and um, uh, I guess informed uh, action. Mm -hmm. And I think back to you know Frank Bowling, who's also in the show, um, who was very much at odds, always one always sort of you know starting off with a more representational practice like way early on and then gradually gradually always moving to abstraction and and when you look at how he his personal experiences engaged with a political the political person and then you know went further into abstraction um it it really starts to make sense to me <laughs> yeah. you know that 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 should be the path because there are some things that you just can't that can't be depicted you know, uh, any other way, or that yeah. can't get more to the essence of what it is you're trying to express. Um, yeah. So, so it's it's great. I think it's you know really important you know that you, that you do do that, and um, it can also feel you know at times like a form of resistance to yeah, uh, work. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I look at Stanley Whitney and uh, a, an artist who you know is I, I would like to hear it from him. You know, but it, it almost feels like a form of resistance to just say like it's resisting to uh perform your ethnicity for the audience in a way you know that um that yeah uh, like and, and in, in the case of stanley whitney it's it is quite formal more i would say than uh than what i do um you know because i do like to uh like i said tease that line of what's exotic or you know what, what right. forms can be perceived to be non-western and so on but um yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think I, that there could be a whole kind of uh, conversation around that because I, I yeah, it's uh, I don't I've not I've not come to any conclusions about that. But I no, it's something, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. No, I definitely it's and it's perennial and um, you know it's big it's a big topic uh, and I think it'll evolve. You know, it's going to constantly evolve. Um, but you're going to, you know, when you do the panel, uh, Ginny Yu, who's also in the show, is definitely looking at these same questions as well. So it'll be interesting to see how you, you know, how you unpack it, you know, together. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, this has been, this has been great. Oh, good. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I enjoyed it too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, you know, for spending this time with us. And um, I really hope we can actually see each other one day soon ish yeah i hope so too yeah yeah it's a uh, I, it, i'm really happy to be in this show and um and uh and i think that the conversations that we're having are really important so uh thanks for inviting me yeah my pleasure yeah take care and we'll, we'll keep in touch